Good afternoon, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to St Paul's Cathedral and to this um, Sunday forum session. Uh, my name is Rosemary Morton and I am the Sixth Centre here at the Cathedral, um, which, if you don't know anything about strange titles that clergy use, means that I help to look after the liturgy and the music here. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to introduce to you Sally Welsh, who is going to talk to us about pilgrimage. It could be said that we are in a time of um, a global renaissance of pilgrimage. More than 200,000 pilgrims walk the Camiano de Santiago each year, and here in the UK, the British Pilgrimage Trust was set up in 2014, aiming to revive Britain's pilgrimage tradition. It welcomes people of all faiths and no faith alike to connect with Britain's holy places. Our speaker today, as I've mentioned, is the Reverend Dr Sally Welsh, and she's been going on pilgrimage for over 20 years and has followed some of the most beautiful and ancient pilgrim routes, both in the UK and abroad. Sally is the Vicar of Charbury in the Diocese of Oxford and is also Area Dean of Chipping Norton. She's joined us here today to share some of her experiences of how to go on pilgrimage well and what it has taught her about, amongst other things, trust, travelling lightly and the joys of companionship. As she shares from her book, Pilgrim Journeys, Pilgrimage for Walkers and Armchair Travellers, she'll reflect on how insights gained on the journey can be incorporated into the spirituality of our everyday lives. Sally's going to speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. We're going to finish quite promptly at two o'clock, at which point you'll then be able to buy a copy of the book at the um, wonderfully discounted price of 6 99 um, if you'd like to, and Sally also will be available to sign copies. So on that note, please would you welcome Sally. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for such a nice introduction. You've made me sound much more grown up and serious, actually, than this talk is likely to be, because essentially it's me talking about myself and my favourite thing, which is pilgrimage, and, and how I got here, and the things I've, the things I've learned. Mm. So this is me. This is me at my best, I think. This is Sally Pilgrim. I began pilgrimage really way back in, um, before I got ordained. Before you, um, before you get ordained, you go on a three-day silent, often, silent retreat. For me, by the end of those three days, I was um, uh, beside myself because being quiet and sitting still is totally not something I am comfortable with. So in one respect, it is a good way to begin ordained ministry thinking, um, I really shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be doing this, I have got a bad case of imposter syndrome. Um, in the other, other respect, it was slightly unsettling, but I, it did make me determined to find some way of praying, of deepening my relationship with God that actually would also keep me sane, keep me going and sustain me during, during my, my ministry. So obviously, like all good resolutions, nothing really happened. And um, I carried on with ordinary parish life, which I loved, which I absolutely loved. This is me looking as if I'm going to drop a baby in the font, but I didn't. Um, but, but at the back of my mind was still the awareness that despite the, um, the earthing nature of morning and evening prayer, something, there was something missing. And then, and then that something missing turned up because just when child three reached her 10th birthday, child four appeared, which also meant that we had to rethink not only our entire life plans, basically, but we had to find a kind of way of spending time together that reached all, all the family. So the oldest was 14, the youngest was zero. We had absolutely no money at all, but we still needed to get out of the house occasionally. And the answer seemed to be pilgrimage, a spiritual journey to a sacred place. That's the definition really in its, its broadest sense, because it included adventure, time together, time for reflection, history, awesome destinations, and it was cheap and easy to do. 
So really, what you're going to hear now are, are, are kind of some of the wisdoms that I have gathered following 20 years of pilgrimage in all sorts of places with all sorts of people. The wonderful thing about all the journeys I've been on is that just as pilgrimage is a, is a metaphor for the Christian journey through the world, so the lessons that you learn while you're on the road can be applied not, not just to the road, but to your everyday life and to your emotional and physical and spiritual lives as well. I'm going to structure this by talking about some of my favourite pilgrimage routes and then, and then some of the insights that I have gathered while, while doing the walking. So this is the first thing, be true to your journey. And I'm giving with each, with each insight a, a scripture as well. So guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Columbus Way runs right the way across Scotland for nearly 200 miles from Iona to St Andrews. It is very hilly, very challenging terrain, but as you can imagine, stunningly beautiful in places. I have only walked part of St Columbus Way um, because that's all I could manage at the time. And I think that's, that is part of the key to pilgrimage because it's all about you. It's all about your pilgrimage to start with. There are no rules. Every, almost every pilgrimage you go on, you will meet people that say, no, this is the right way to do it. This is the authentic way to do it. This is the only true way to do it. I would disagree with that. I would say that the way you choose, the way you can do your pilgrimage is the best way for you. Obviously, in an ideal world, we set off and then we spend the next three months or four months or however long our legs last walking along one route to an awesome destination like Santiago de Compostela or Rome or, if we're really brave, Jerusalem. But actually, we have work, we have holidays, we have family commitments, we have financial crises. There is nothing to stop us making pilgrimages in stages, starting when you like, using as long as you like, and then going back to it. I know I've met people on the Camino who have been taking years to do the trip, and they just come back and pick up where they, where they stopped the previous time. This is a lovely lady I met, and I was halfway through France by the time I met this person, and she had walked all the way from Belgium with her horse and her dog and was planning to go all the way to Santiago de Compostela. If you are going to go on pilgrimage, you need to think about the reasons that you have for undertaking the journey. You need to make sure, especially, that they are powerful enough to keep you going when the going gets tough. One of the things I always say is, um, before you go on pilgrimage, write five reasons for making the journey five things, five expectations you have about the journey and then bin it because the reasons that you discover on the road will be the ones that keep you going and the experiences that you have that are the most powerful will be the ones that you never expected to have. It's okay to go by car, it's okay to cycle, it's okay to walk a bit and drive a bit. There is, as I said, a hierarchy of pilgrimage where, where blisters are worn like badges, really, and, and you have to do it as genuinely as possible. And there are things that you learn by walking, by getting up each day and carrying on the journey, whether you want to or not, whether it's raining or whether the sun is shining, that, that you can't learn any other way. But if you can't walk, then at least, at least just go for it. These um, lovely people are my parents who occasionally, when I'm walking alone in countryside that they think is unsuitable, will, um, will meet me by car at the beginning or end of a journey. And this is another time, I can't even remember which country this was in, but my father's special pleasure was to drive round the countryside and trying to communicate with anybody he met along the road in whatever language, he always spoke English, obviously, just in a louder and louder voice, saying, have you seen a middle-aged woman with a backpack walking down this road? 
And um, this occasion, he met me and he said, he said, I've just seen a woman who didn't know, who hadn't seen you at all. He said, and I said I was looking for a pilgrim. And she said, she called me a pilgrim. And he said to me, and I said, no, 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 I'm not a pilgrim. She said, and then the woman turned to him, to them both, and said, but pilgrimage is in the heart. And actually, that's what I would say. If your heart's intention is pilgrimage, then that's what you're doing. Trust, trust yourself. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. I'm particularly fond of this quote because it is a quote within a quote because it refers back to Isaiah, which appears in the morning canticles for, I think it's Advent season. And um, whenever I say morning prayer, we always say a special prayer for people who have just had knee operations when we get to this bit. Trust yourself. This is St. James's Way, which is the route along the River Severn. Um, I can't actually remember where it starts. The bit I walked was from Worcester to Bristol and is called St. James's Way, better known as the Seven Way. But a lot of these pilgrimage routes, of course, would have been trade routes as well. And that's how come they, they grew up, how they did and how they cover a network of just not just um, the UK, but Europe as well, because pilgrims and merchants both used, both used the same um, roads. So following the course of the River Severn, um, it's, a, it's a peaceful route. It's quite an easy route. It doesn't demand great feats of endurance because you've got lots of towns and lots of accommodation and, and food. So it's quite a nice one to, to go along, actually. As part of my... One of, the, one of the upsides of my job is that I get to give lectures like this and hold workshops on pilgrimage. And I kind of come to the conclusion there are, there are three types of people that come to these lectures. And you're all going to prove me wrong, I know. There are those who have done it all, been on pilgrimage, been there, got that, got all the badges. There are those who are thinking that they might be wanting to go on pilgrimage and have got as far as maybe buying the book and the route and perhaps thinking a bit more firmly about it. And another group who would really like to go on pilgrimage but are a little bit frightened about doing so and just, just anxious about the whole concept, particularly if they're planning on going on their own. And we're right to be anxious even fearful because a long distance pilgrimage is a big thing it challenges you mentally emotionally and physically and it has always been recognized as such it is not as scary and dangerous as it was in medieval times when you needed to make your will before you were allowed to get permission to go on pilgrimage because chances were you weren't going to come back again and they needed to know what to do with the property you left behind you needed to go in a group because otherwise wild animals, pirates, thieves would all get you. So it's not that big an undertaking, but it still is. There are still challenges. This is me. Well, it's my feet in a washing up bowl full of water because I had just hideous blisters at the time. Pilgrimage is physically challenging. You can't deny it. But one of the things you can do is have faith that you can do it, trust yourself, and travel according to your own pace. Once again, it's going back to going, this is, this is mine, and I'm going to make it mine. The blisters I had that I was trying to soak in this particular occasion occurred on, um, it wasn't the seven way, it was another pilgrimage when my lovely parents had parked the car at the end of a long straight road and were waiting for me to arrive. So I was at one end of the road and there was this car with the engine revving at the end of the road and I thought, I have just got to get there as quickly as I can. And I walked too fast and I got blisters. I should have gone at my own pace. There are physical fears. This is, I don't know whether you can see, here is a man. This is walking along the Seven Way, which goes through some really bleak industrial areas. And I was walking through this, and it was 
quite early in the morning, there was nobody around, I was all on my own, and there was a man with a dog following me. And every, I would go fast and it would, he would stay at the same pace and I would slow down, he'd stay at the same pace and I was getting quite frightened. And in the end I stopped and did up my shoelace and um, let him overtake and then I took a picture because by that time I was in such a tizzy that I was thinking, tell you what, if I do get attacked and killed, the last photo on my phone will be of this man and then the police can get him. You know, sometimes you really do have to, have to get a grip. Um, and this is another one. This is, this is about the countryside. I don't even know why I'm telling you this. Um, I had walked for about an hour going into Woodland and according to my map, I had another hour still to go and I thought do you know what if something happens to me here nobody's going to know and I am n just not going to be able to get near enough to civilization to seek help. My phone was there wasn't very good phone reception but I could text so I texted my loving husband who was at work and I just texted I'm in the middle of a forest I'm all on my own and I'm frightened and he texted back five famous words, think Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> For which I thank him. Um, but actually, it was also a way of saying, you are letting your fears really get the better of you. And you've just got to have courage and you just have to keep going and believe that, that you will get there. And look, still here. Um, this, is, this is not the seven way at its best because I got there and there was just no way of seeing where the path was and it was covered in stinging nettles. And actually life can be like that sometimes when you simply can't see the way forward and it seems that every way you go, pain is going to be involved. We are being asked more to do more than we can, to give more than we've got, or maybe we're just really anxious about the future. And consolation, support, comfort can be very hard to come by. Sometimes you get help for the seven way by um, just remembering all the people that have walked that way before you. So not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. We will not be the only people that have experienced the dark night of the soul or the suffering or the grief or the anxiety. Nor were we ever promised as Christians that we would live a trouble-free life. Perhaps all we can do is kneel silently with heroes and saints and pray in the words that apocryphally are scratched on a, a concentration camp wall by a World War II prisoner. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. And I believe in love even when there's no one there. And I believe in God even when he is silent. The wonderful thing about pilgrimage is that it takes you away from your daily cares and your preoccupations and allows you time to reflect and think. And although I'm not a great fan of being still and reflecting and thinking, <coughs> pilgrimage is what does it for me because it's, it's active and it allows me time, it allows me time to get away from the daily routine, but also to get my strength for the daily routine. Um, and I think that's essentially the story of Mary and Martha. This is, this is the quote at the end of it. If you remember when Mary gets so stroppy, uh, Martha gets so stroppy about having to do all the housework and everything while Mary sits at Jesus' feet that she comes in and, and says to Jesus, you've just got to say something to Mary because I'm doing my nut out here in the kitchen, all words to that effect. And Jesus said, actually, right now, Mary's doing what needs to be doing to be done. So it's a sort of reminder to us all that, that it is only in the stopping that we find the strength to do the carrying on. This is one of my favourite pilgrimage routes. It's the via Latin word I can't pronounce that goes from Vesele. It actually runs all the way to Santiago de Compostela. I walked it to Limoges. The first week I walked 
with my daughter, and then the next two weeks I walked by myself. It is, it is absolutely beautiful, almost completely unpopulated. You can walk all day and not, not see a soul. So you go through, um, it's Burgundy, essentially, Burgundy countryside where uh, the villages are small. That stuff about being a bakery in every village in France, not true. Sometimes you have to walk a long way before you find food and drink, and that was a learning point, I can tell you. Um, as are places to stay, very few in number. So you have to actually plan your journey quite carefully if you're gonna, if you're gonna do that walk. But then you get places like Bourges, which is a, a beautiful sort of medieval city. So you get countryside and townscape, and then you um, gradually get more populated as you go further south. And I finished, as I said, in the beautiful city of Limoges. And that's uh, one of the beauties of it is, is the balance. So you get city and you get country, you get lots of people, you get very few people. And that's, that's the same thing that we need in our own lives and also in our spiritual lives. I think sometimes um, the danger is if we start on, along a track of spirituality or a way of praying, we go, yep, yeah, I can do this, I am liking this, it is helping me, and we, there is a danger that we get stuck in a rut and maybe don't find the balance that we need. Perhaps if our relationship with God deepens, we may find other other habits that we need to start and to form so that we can get sustenance in a, in a different and possibly more challenging way. If we enter times of difficulty or sadness or suffering, then maybe it may be that there is um, some other way of praying that we need to tap into so that we can get, get the support or comfort that we require. So it's a good idea, I think, to, to keep, keep looking keep exploring, keep being open to the different prayer environments that are on offer to us, and there are so many around today. Carry only what is necessary. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. There's a tough one. This is the um, Via Inglese, which goes from Ferrol to Santiago de Compostela. My geography is rubbish, but it's essentially, instead of going across Spain to Santiago, you start at the top where the, it's called the English route, because it's where people who took a boat from a English port, would, English pilgrims in medieval times would have taken the boat to the nearest Spanish bit, which was then the nearest bit to Santiago de Compostela and walked from there. Because, of course, in medieval times, you did not want to make your journey too long or too dangerous because it was long enough and dangerous enough as it was. So you take the boat to the port at Ferrol and then walk down. It has the advantage of being 120 kilometers from Santiago de Compostela, which means you qualify for that all-important certificate, the, you know, the thing that says you've done it, you've walked the Camino which mostly is why we did it. The other reason we did it this route and not the more popular one is because we were taking our youngest, who was 10 at the time, and I didn't feel that having a 10-year-old boy sharing a large mixed dormitory was necessarily the right sort of um, pilgrimage education he should be getting. So we did stay in, the accommodation is not so much accommodation, and it's more like hotels, far fewer hostels. Absolutely, if you are to go away from this talk with no other piece of wisdom, travel light is what I would leave you with. Take as little as you possibly can, because the less you carry, the easier your journey will be. It is incredibly easy when you're planning your journey to look at all this fabulous gear that there is available for walkers and pilgrims and there is a lot of it. And to go, oh, I need one of these, and oh, perhaps two or maybe three of these. And sometimes our anxiety makes us take more than we need as well. Absolutely keep it to a minimum. You need a phone charger. You need a phone. 
you need blister plasters, you need some money. Almost everything else, you know what you can do without? The more you carry, the more exhausted you will get. The more things you put in, just in case, the more likely you make it that that eventuality that you are planning for will happen to you. This is our, te this is our ten year old feeling incredibly sorry for himself. His pack was not that heavy, I'd just like to say. <laughs> this is, I really apologise to people who are under 18 here, this is a scene of smoking. Smoking is not a good thing and is very dangerous. Just putting that out there. This is my Ellie, who was nine when she did this pilgrimage, and this is her with her very first backpack, which is quite small because she was only a child. Um, I was carrying the baby, James, on my back at the time, so we also had to divide out my luggage, because I could only carry the baby, and the baby's luggage. So actually, you can't see Jeremy's backpack, but it is nearly as big as he is. But we made the children carry their own packs, carry everything they needed themselves. And you can see this is Elle's, when she went with me the first bit of the pilgrimage I did, the, um, uh, the one to Limoges, still keeps up with that very, very light pack. She has in there everything that she needs for the journey. Just for the record, she has stopped smoking and has taken up marathon running instead. Um, I, I, uh, one of the most annoying things about the whole trip was actually her walking next to me and, um, and going, do you know if we ran this, we could do it in an hour? And you think, yes, yes, and I love you too. <laughs> Travelling light on pilgrimage, absolute necessity. Do you know what? I think that's quite transferable. The more things and possessions we own in everyday life, the more weighed down we are by them, the more weighed down by anxiety of hanging on to them, the more care we have to take about them, the less time we have for the things that really matter. Inhabit the moment. Another famous, I've gone for all the famous sayings here, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. North Wales Pilgrim Path, beautiful. I've probably said that about every walk so far, haven't I? They're all lovely in their own ways. This was a stunner. We did this, um, I think I did it with Ellie again, after Easter. So the weather, I mean, it's North Wales, so mostly it rained, which on, on the good side meant that when it stopped raining, you really appreciated the countryside. It ends in Aberdaran, where the poet R.S. Thomas had his church. And you can, if the weather's good, take the ferry to Bardsey Island. We couldn't because, of course, by the time we got to Aberdaran, it was chucking it down again. I once had the privilege of walking part of the journey with um, a guy who had, I think he'd reached the end of, he'd retired, I think. He'd been a city dweller all his life and he'd gone on pilgrimage. And he could not believe the beauty of the countryside around him. And I walked with him and he knew the name of every flower and he made me lie down and look up at the clouds and then he made me bend down very closely and look at all the different um, moss there was. He was, a, he was a total joy to be with because he was so involved with the landscape. I mean, I did have to walk on and leave him because we were going really slowly and I knew I wouldn't get to where I needed to get, but it just gave me a completely different perspective. Um, and that's the danger, as, as I'm sure you are aware of, of contemporary life today, that we rush on to our destination points and forget to take note of the beauty that is happening around us. Here, once again, this is um, a testimony of my awesome photography skills, but he here, there, that's a seal. I'd never seen seals before. And we were walking along the top of the coast path, and I suddenly looked down and saw a seal. And it was just such a tremendous moment. And if I hadn't been there and I hadn't been looking, I would not have seen it. One of the joys of walking is that, of course, you have a chance to really inhabit 
the countryside because everything goes past you so slowly. And you get a chance to reflect on who you are, where you're going, and the environment that surrounds you. And it is vital, I think, that we do that, that every now and then we stop and we go, I am living right here, right now. One of my favourite quotes is the one from First Letter of John, where he says, you are children of God now. And it's actually going, right now, I'm fine, it's good, and I'm a child of God. Rejoice in your companions. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. The Thames Pilgrim Way, I walked from Radcot Bridge to Raysbury, which is right the way across the Diocese of Oxford. It was, I was involved in planning it, it was Bishop John Pritchard's kind of last hooray. It was his way on retirement of saying goodbye to his diocese. We did it in 10 days, it's 100 miles. We did 10 miles a day for 10 days. It, it was lovely. At times there were 40 people, sometimes there were only half a dozen, particularly in the bits that, um, that had no public transport. But it was a real privilege to walk with so many different people who had so many different stories to tell. And I, it was very humbling as well, because I would be making my usual snap judgments and go, hmm, so I'm stuck with you all morning. You look boring. And then you'd discover that he was in charge of the whole, I, I can't actually, of the whole traffic system for a city. And you go, wow. And, and talk so fascinatingly about the issues of traffic lights and roundabouts. True life. You would just never have believed it. You get to know people really well when you're going on pilgrimage. You meet them or you take them with you. You can meet them on the route or you can be the ones that you go with you. Um, or sometimes just as you're walking along, the number of times that people have stopped and said to me, are you on pilgrimage in whatever language of the country I was traveling in? And I've said, yes, and they've gone, God bless you, or we'll pray for you. Of people who have offered me glasses of water, I clearly look really shuttered when I'm walking, glasses of water or rest, um, of people that gave our 10-year-old son sweets and biscuits and encouraging words and then looked at us as if we were committing some hideous act of child cruelty. Um, I think he thought we were, actually. It, they just, they, they kind of give you the opportunity to learn about people and to accept from people. We're often not very good at taking from others. It, almost, I think we're better at giving than we are at receiving. So pilgrimage is a way of accepting hospitality and support. It, it's wonderful for deepening and strengthening relationships with the family. This is my big boy when he was 16. Simon, and I have his permission to say this, was not an easy teenager. And when he reached 16, he was about as horrible as, as it was possible for a teenager to get. So with, with some trepidation that, that he and I set off, just he and I, for a week on pilgrimage. But but he was incredible. All the sulkiness had gone, all the stroppiness, the rudeness. He was just like, I'm in charge and I'm going to look after you, mother. Um, I can't map read. I can't speak French. Um, I'm not even very strong, but that doesn't matter. I'm still, I'm going to look after you. And you go, great, great, Simon. There's one time I remember, especially, we, you can see there's a roll mat on the top. We took our tents with us. Tents weigh such a lot. Just take that from me. And we were walking along, and it was the end of the day. It was hot. We were tired, and we got to the campsite. And it was uh, the ground was really hard, so we knew it was going to be tough putting the tents up. Um, and we were both hungry and feeling quite low, actually. And the lady at the campsite said, "Oh, welcome. Yes, there are always two camping places reserved for pilgrims. But hang on a minute." I might have a chalet free. And she went off to see if there was a chalet empty. And Simon turned to me and he said, pray, mother, because I really hope there's a chalet. And I said, yes, 
yes, I will. And this is from a boy that hadn't been to church since Sunday school, about the age of eight. And I said, yes, yeah, OK, I'll pray. And then he knelt down in the middle of the road. And he said, Neil, Neil. <laughs> so, so I knelt. And actually, my prayer was, God, you know, for all our sakes, let there be a chalet, because this is really important. And, um, and this is the chalet. <laughs> And there is Simon just washing his socks and hanging them on the rail. And we had showers and we had a hot meal. And um, I would like to say that Simon was a different person after that. But obviously, that's not true. He was still a teenager when he got back home. But, but the memory of that time and the, and the joy of the chalet actually kept us both going through the rest of those turbulent teenage years. This is, um, OK, this is, this is, I'm just to show you, I do walk with bishops, OK? Um, but this is also, this is Sarah Merrick, who used to be the director of communications for the Diocese of Oxford, who came on the pilgrimage, the Thames Path, with, her, with us. She's wearing a fixed grin because she has just spent an hour walking with a very, very difficult pilgrim. Not one of those in the picture, I hasten to add, but another one. Such a difficult pilgrim that we used to divide our time up as to who would walk with her so that nobody else would have to. But you know what? By the end of the trip, she had changed and mellowed and her gratitude at, at the company, the companions and, you know, those of us who were walking with her, completely transformed her. And, and it was a joy. Relationships with fellow travellers can be really intense and, and very, very rewarding. It's, you form a, a community on the road. You hear people's stories. You judge people differently because it's not about their wealth or their job or anything like that. It's, it's about how they behave on the road. And actually taking that back home, you know, never mind what you've got or what you do, who are you and how do you serve others? Coming into the home straight now, celebrate the journey. And this is one or another one of my favourite passages telling the story of the, that early Christian church. Day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. St Olav's Way runs from Stickelstadt to Nidaros, which is modern day Trondheim. Beautiful another beautiful route not easy very mountainous uh, very changeable weather conditions route finding really rough because because I don't know what they did with some of those route signs well you can see this one's hanging in a tree can you imagine how hard it is to find a sign that's hanging in a tree when you're in a forest um, also really really expensive because it's because it's Norway so everything costs about a trillion pounds nonetheless completely worth it this is, this is a slide that, that isn't one of mine. It, it kind of symbolises the way some people had um, approached pilgrimage. They'd done everything right. I went to a talk and they were, they'd done everything right. They'd packed properly. They'd done their research. They'd done their training. They took their boots off at every break. They stopped at hourly intervals to rehydrate and rested for at least 20 minutes every two hours. And, and it was so well planned, so well organised, so efficiently executed. And on the way out of the lecture, I overheard a man saying, well, that doesn't sound like much bloody fun, does it? <laughs> and, you know, pilgrimage is all about enjoying the journey. At the end of the day, it's about having a huge amount of fun. It's companionship at a level deeper than you usually experience. It's about pain sharper than you may ever have suffered before. Those are my husband's feet, by the way, and he had really bad blisters. It's about a joy that you can't ever have anticipated happening to you at times that you just weren't expecting it. It's a path, it's a discovering, it's a process that carries on long after the journey has ended. And I think the best gift that we can get from the road is celebrating every step of life's journey.
Sometimes the way is hard. Sometimes the route is obscured. There will be pain and suffering that slows us down. But at other times, green hills and loving companionship will make many miles seem just like a few. Oh, more bishops. <laughs> All we can offer is a heart full of praise, ready to accept the dangers and the delights of the journey open to every day's adventure. And this is me with my feet in the Sea of Galilee, which was another fabulous experience. I never thought I needed to go and see those places where Jesus had walked. But by a great stroke of fortune, I, I was invited to do so. And it is transformative. It was wonderful. Because in return, we receive the assurance of Christ, who travels with us all the time, not only walking alongside us, but coming to meet us as we approach our journey's end, ready to embrace us and lead us home. I love going on pilgrimage. I have shared the insights I have gained with you, but the best advice I can give you is just go out there and do it. There you go. Thank you very much, Sunny. That was uh, really interesting and enlightening. Um, we've got um, a short time now, around just under 15 minutes, for um, questions, and you're welcome to offer your questions. And let's start here. Yes, um, thank you very much for, for your talk. Um, one thing you've not mentioned, and I hope when I read your book, I can find you, we can deduce from what you've said, you are obviously a very brave lady. Um, we know when our Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was on the cross, it reached a point when he said, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And we know through your talk that in such a moment you had to text your friend and your dear husband and he gave you those five soothing words. What is it that makes you when you reach such a moment as our Lord and Savior reached, uh, what is it that sustained you? You you've given God that be open to God as Christians we all have to, to do that. Therefore, yes. I'm I, I don't consider myself brave. And there are some days when I'm walking on my own where I wake up and I think I'm not sure I can even do this. And and sometimes I do because I simply have to. When we when we were walking with the children at some stage in the journey, one or other of them would always sit on the ground and go, I can't go any further. And then we would say to them, okay, so now what? Here we are in the middle of nowhere. What options have you got? And, and the answer is actually getting up and carrying on. And sometimes that is all that is left to us. And sometimes I think in our spiritual journeys as well, when, it, when it, the times are dark, and, and the way is hard, then there is no way out but through. And, and we take what comfort we can from our companions, from Christ. And sometimes it seems as if his face is veiled as well. And then we just have to keep going, believing in God, even when it seems as if he's silent. Thank you. That's a bit harsh, I'm afraid. In the second row, yes. Small question. A uh, small question is, you put a, a, a screen shot on, this, on the board, you didn't refer to it, at least not directly, I just wondered if it was a particular, we're trying to work out where it was, it's, it looks like it's suddenly, it's, it is, and I can probably go all the way back, you can't I? Reason, yes, uh, yes I did, like hang on, it is, I'm sure there's a better way of doing this, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Okay, I will talk while I flick back. It is the view down to the Sea of Galilee. Oh, they, oh, hang on, that's quite good, isn't it? It is the view down to the Sea of Galilee from the Mount of Beatitudes. You can walk from the top of the Mount of Beatitudes down to the sea, and, and as you are doing so, you can, you can see the whole of the countryside and, and go where 
it is easier to, to kind of think, gosh, this might have been where he sent them. That's very interesting. This is the second question. You've done, you've seen a great many pilgrimages, at least 20 pilgrimages. Quite a lot, yes. But which one uh, would you say gave you the sort of greatest sort of spiritual learning? If you had to come up one or possibly two, I mean, we know the countryside in these places is very nice and beautiful and so on generally. What would you say was the highlight of your I think. Walking along part of the Jesus Trail in the Holy Land was transformative. And also perhaps the very first one that we did with the whole family when I had the baby on my back and the three children and my husband and we walked from Assisi to Gubbio in the path of St. Francis. And, and that because it was our first and it was just so new and discovering all about pilgrimage really as well. I think that I've got a soft spot for that. Yeah. We did not, yes, because we don't do things by heart. We thought, gosh, if we're going to do this, we might as well just crack on and, and, and yeah, go for a tough one. Thank you. Uh, at the back in the red scarf, yes. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just wondered, right at the beginning, you gave the definition of pilgrimage. And in it, I can't remember the exact words, but in it was the journey to a holy place. And I was just wondering whether every walking experience is a pilgrimage and whether the Pennine Way is a pilgrimage or whether it's something different in your experience. I define pilgrimage for the purpose of these talks as a spiritual journey to a sacred place. I think Intention is incredibly important. So any walk you set out on, if you have the intention of making it a pilgrimage, so the intention of meeting Christ, of deepening your relationship with God, of discovering, <coughs> of experiencing, of sharing, that makes it a pilgrimage. However, destination, I think, is also important. Somewhere like the Pennine Way, there are churches along the route, and, and entering into those sacred spaces and spending time there, I think, is quite important. In medieval times, the emphasis was much more on the destination than the journey. It is only in contemporary pilgrimage that actually the, the transformation comes on the journey itself, because, of course, in medieval times, you were trying to get to a place, and if you could have flown there, you would have done that, because it was all about um, the, the holy site and the reconciliation or healing or whatever it was you were hoping to find there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman here on my left, yes. In the early 70s, I did the Student Cross three times, which is from Eastern England to Walsingham, and also Northern Cross. And I noticed that they're still doing it. Yes, they are. I've not, uh, the church that I used to work with used to send, um, I mean, somebody had been doing Student Cross for for 30 or 40 years and was now an organiser. So yes, they are still doing it. Yes, it's very popular. I was talking yesterday to one of the chaplains at Walsingham and he was saying, you know, that's, that's kind of their pilgrimage experience is Student Cross. Can you do it if you're not a student? I don't know, don't know. <sighs> you are allowed to camp wild in France you are not allowed to wild camp in Spain. Um, when we travel with children, we always book somewhere. So we tend not to go to hostels because you can't always be sure, particularly on the popular routes, you can't always be sure of finding a place. And I have known other people who have got to hostels and been told, no, you have to walk on another five or 10 kilometers, which is just desperate. Um, I have, but, but yes, I have always found somewhere although sometimes they have not been very nice. Yes, I'd like to just add what was the Camino del Norte a couple of years ago, um, to come across there and then on to finish there. And I'd like to offer you the hot tip somebody gave me, and I say, walking 550 miles, I didn't have a single blister. And what you do is you buy yourself a little pack of merino wool, you buy it for yourself. Yeah. 
and you put it next to your skin, inside your inner sock, and it turns to felt, basically. Yeah. And yes. your skin never missed it. It's absolutely incredible. It's, I have heard of merino wool as a cure. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a compede girl myself, yes. um, which I do recommend. Don't go anywhere without compede. And usually I don't get, well, I will, I will try that. I mean, as I said, this is the only time I've got them. And it was, I'm sure, because I was not walking at my pace. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was also struck, because you said something about it's, it's actually an affair of the heart. Yes. And I think that's what, how you know you're on pilgrimage in a way. Because it's like some sort of huge magnet gets so, yeah. And, and the awful thing about pilgrimage, and let me warn you, is that once you've done one, you get there and you go, Hmm, where can I go next? And it's, and it's, you know, as soon as you reach your destination, you're planning the next one. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to ask a question from the coach, which is um, for a first time book, uh, what would be your recommendation for a route in the United States that someone should try if they've never ever been on a pilgrimage before? Oh, that's actually a really tough one. I would. I would be tempted to go on one where the route finding is very easy. So actually something like the Thames Pilgrim Way, if I can recommend it, because there is a booklet provided, then it, and it takes the path and just goes, and here is another layer, a spiritual layer to put on top of it. It's also populated enough that you don't feel that, that scared, but not so busy that you feel overwhelmed. So Thames Path, go for it. Thames Path, very good, thank you. Any further questions from the floor? Uh, yes, at the back, yes. You have to be very careful when you Google, because you Google Pilgrim Trail and you just bush a whole load of them. I, I suggest you go into a big bookshop, actually, and look through those, because a lot of the pilgrimage trails now are documented. So do that, and then, then choose one that, that you like the look of, and that suits your, how far you want to walk, and your accommodation needs as well. Thank you. Any further questions from the floor? Uh, yes, right at the back. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you a little question about your book? The contents page of the book that uh, you're going to share with us. Sorry. Because I'm wondering whether I should buy the book or not. Oh, oh. It's, there's a copy here, you can have a look at it. I just want to know what the content is. Well, what it does is it lists, I think it's 10 pilgrim routes, and then 10 nuggets, and then I talk about the pilgrim routes and, and what I learned from doing each route. You, please don't feel obliged to, to buy the book. <laughs> it's okay. My husband hasn't even read it, but he does like the picture on the front. Yes, do you? You've done some pilgrims while you call short pilgrims yeah. four days. Um, I think quite a nice introduction. Yeah. I haven't yeah. actually done it yet, but it's a lovely part of the world, but it's quite nice to be I like the coastal paths, I think they're lovely. The, yeah, yes, I've done the southwest coast path, but there again didn't really feel like a call it a pilgrimage because I didn't really engage tremendously with the sacred sites along it. No, St Bernard Pass, the, the hostel. Right, I'm just saying it. I'm, I'm what's the word? Amplifying it. Right, good one, is it? Oh right. No, I haven't. Sorry. Interesting, actually. They're, they're now, the oldest is now 28. The 28, 26, 24, and 14. The 14 year old will not walk anywhere if he can help it. And he's the one, of course, that, that we all started as. So he's the one that started on my back, and we made him you know, do them all because, because you've got to take the youngest one with you, haven't you? Because of childcare. Um, Ellie, the, the child three, Ellie, is a abs absolute, will go on any pilgrimage anywhere, absolutely loves it. Simon, um, yeah, not so much. And Ellie's, uh, my older daughter's got two young children, so, so but, but Will, 
I'm sure we'll go back to it. And they all remember it. There's, I've just got time for one more. The first pilgrimage, my older daughter was 14 at the time, and she was a real girl, and it was her principle that you should not have to walk anywhere, shouldn't have to do anything that you couldn't do in stilettos. And that was her life rule. So we got to Assisi, and she was so grumpy, just so awful. And we were walking to our hotel, and we stopped at a shoe shop, and of course, Italian shoes, beautiful. And there was a pair of shoes, pink shoes, with the Andy Warhol picture of Marilyn Monroe on the toe. And she looked at them, and I said, in a moment of inspiration, Jessica, if you make this pilgrimage without complaining, I will buy you those shoes when we get back. <laughs> So day one comes, and we're going up this hill, and it's pouring with rain, and, and I can see Jessie's mouth. And I say, Jessie, what, what are you saying? What are you doing? She said, I'm thinking of my shoes. I'm thinking of my shoes. <laughs> and she was lovely, actually. And at the end of the trip, I bought her those shoes, and she has kept them, and she still has them now. Oh, thank, you. thank you all very much. Um, if you'd like to take a seat. So I'm afraid that's all that we have time for this afternoon, but it's been a really interesting session and we're really grateful to Sally for coming and speaking to us. Um, there will be uh, books on sale uh, now and Sally will be here to um, sign copies if you'd like that. Our next Sunday forum is on the 4th of March with Megan Daffern on her new book, Songs of the Spirit, A Psalm a Day for Lent and Easter. And our next Cathedral Floor event is called Scandal and Glory, the Cross in the Bible and Poetry, and that's with Paula Gooder and Mark Oakley, and that's on the evening of Tuesday the 13th of March. Our new leaflet is also available at the front, there are copies just here on the desk, please do take one if you don't already have a copy, and we would really like to see you again at further events, and we're really glad that you were able to join us today. So please would you join me in thanking Sally.